Thank you, Pastor Allen. And welcome everyone out all over the internet. <clears throat> you can tell we've remodeled the church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, what's going on here in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Farmers Branch, Texas area is we're having a snowstorm. And uh, because of the weather conditions, we uh, told all the brothers and sisters to stay home, watch the service. We won't cower from uh, COVID, but I don't want people being out where people can't drive good and Satan attack them with cars. So we just decided to welcome you into our home here at Angel Castle. This is what we call our house. And this is my study, but we're going to have church, we're going to have the word, and we're going to Send forth without limitations, anointed of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, the uncompromised Word of God, and we continue in faith in Jesus' name. Amen? So if you have your Bibles this morning, we are going to continue in this series of teaching on the sower sows the Word. But I'd also like to remind everyone... We've had people ask us, Pastor TC, how can I send a love offering? How can I send support? Because uh, we never really promote that. We've never really pursued that. But I'm getting more and more requests on people. Now, let me tell you right now, I don't care where you are, all over the world, you do not send your tithe to me. You be a member of a, of a home church. Uh, you, have a, you have your own fellowship church place where you're committed, you're a member, that you offer that pastor not just your physical resources and your help and your... Folks, let me tell you something. Get in a church. If you're not in a church, get in a church right now. Lock in in these last hours. We need the fellowship of one another. We need the building up of one another. We need the challenging of one another. Well, you need to be in a church, and you need to find that a pastor, and you need to tell him, Pastor, here I am. Uh, let me be a blessing. What can I do? Can I sweep the floors? Can I can I straighten chairs? But get involved. Be part of a body, and that's where you tithe. For you people that are asking, how can we send a blessing? How can we send an offering? Some of you have even asked me, how can we tithe? Do you, you do not tithe to me. You find a home church, and you tithe to that home church. You want to send a love offering, love gifts, blessings, then by all means you're welcome to do that. But uh, you, I absolutely will not receive tithes. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not that kind of a minister. You need to be connected to a home church. Amen. Enough of that. If you want to send a love offering, and those that have requested, send it to P.O. Box, New Day Christian Center, P.O. Box four six zero zero three two. Garland, Texas, zip code 75046. One more time. P.O. Box 460032, Garland, Texas, P.O. Box 75046. Amen? And if you look at our YouTube site, right there by that picture of that, probably the most beautiful woman in the world, uh, Pastor Darlene, right next to me, over there, you'll see, you'll see our address there, but it's, it's, I guess it's easy for people to miss, and they haven't noticed it. Amen. Enough said there. If you have your Bibles, let's open up one more time to Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> and I trust that all these other teachings have been, uh, well, I know they're absolute fundamental kingdom truths, but I pray to God that you're having the hand of God come upon you through the Holy Spirit and anoint you with the ability, the spirit of God wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the word without the holy spirit as the teacher you cannot receive revelation which we covered revelation knowledge of what is the written word of god the logos of god amen so in luke chapter 8 let's go back to our foundational scripture and it says in starting in verse Verse 4, And when much people were gathered together, there were come unto him out of every city, and he spake a parable. A sower went out to sow the seed. And as, say it with me, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, 
And we looked last week and these last few weeks that there's a kingdom principle right there that answers a lot of questions with people. How come when I have a heart to start serving God, all hell breaks loose? This is it right here. This is a foundational teaching that as you take a step toward God, God takes a step toward you. Hell takes a step toward you because Satan hates people and Satan wants to attack people because people are God's greatest creation. We're created in God's image. Therefore, he tries to come in and cause people to be not serve God, to die prematurely, become drug addicts, addicted to sin, so that he can mock the Most High by using God's greatest creation to his service instead of the kingdom of God. That's why immediately when you start having a heart to go toward God, God's promise, he'll come close to you. But also, so many preachers say, well, you give your heart to God and everything will get better. As far as your relationship to the kingdom of God, yes, everything immediately starts getting better. But you've also unlocked a whole realm of, of spiritual warfare and battle that you were never even aware of before. And then we went on over here to Matthew chapter 7, that once you start taking that step toward God and, and Satan starts attacking you and all hell starts breaking loose, here's another kingdom principle in Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. Say it with me, the battle begins once I get a heart toward God. The battle begins, intensifies as I get a heart toward God. But here's a kingdom principle you got to understand because a lot of people, when this battle starts, they'll say, well, I didn't have, I've, and I've had them say that to me in my, in my churches. Probably in every church I've, re, I've raised up, I've had them come to me and say, well, I'm going to go back to my denominational church or I'm going to go back to this church or that church because I didn't have it nowhere near this bad when I w was just a, went to church, mind my own business, and, and, and lived my life. In other words, punched their salvation card for Jesus. But here's what you find out very quickly, and I've watched those people over the years. And I don't say this uh, lightly. I don't say it uh, cavalier. I say it with a broken heart. 99.99% .99 of the time when they leave where God's called them, or they leave a good word of faith church, or they, they leave a church where the word, the uncompromised word of God, is being taught and preached and proclaimed without reservation. Their lives get worse. They don't get better. And here's the reason why, right here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and do them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which builds his house upon a rock. And the rain descends, and the clouds, and the floods come, and the wind blows, and beats upon the house. The, the spirit realm starts trying to give you a beating. And there's times I've been under so much a demonic attack, it feels like my flesh is on fire. This is real stuff, folks. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, and that it doesn't have severe effects. These spiritual attacks are real, and they are meant to destroy you. You need to get that through your mind. This walk in the Spirit, this serving God stuff, as some put it, is life and death. And if you enter into this just about, like, you know, like, well, what can I get from God and it's all about me, you're a victim looking for a place to happen. You need to become a servant of God, a warrior of God, armed and dangerous with God, and you need to do it fast. Not only for your own salvation and not only for your own progression and growing and maturity, but for the benefit of the kingdom of God. God gets no glory out of victims. He gets glory out of people that can raise his banner, win the loss, cast out devils, and take back dominion where hell used to rule. Hallelujah. So you're, this, the floods are going to come. The rain's going to come. Satan's going to start beating on you, but you built your house on the rock. Amen. And here's what the Lord says. And beat upon that house, and it fell not. So Satan can beat all he wants. He can bring all the storms he wants. He can rain on you all he wants, and you're going to stand. Why? Because you're connected, committed, and you have established your life on Jesus Christ, the rock of your salvation. 
That doesn't mean just getting saved. It says building your house. That's your, your life here on earth, your kingdom dwelling, where you live and you dwell and you have your being. All that you do and live for is built on Jesus. That's a far cry beyond just being saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Now it goes on to this second category. And there's only two categories. You're either a doer of the word or you're not. Well, I wish people get a revelation of that. You can be saved and not be a doer and your life be completely different than saved and a doer. We covered that, I believe it was last week, where I talked about when I was first raised up after I got saved in, the, in my first pastor, Pastor Dan Thompson in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, love you, Pastor Dan. To this day, I, I value you and esteem you highly. <clears throat> I was talking about, right in front of my eyes, I saw this lived out. I saw this so clearly uh, demonstrated with the two ladies and both of them had teenage boys and both of them had the identical head injuries and both of them went to the same hospital and both of them uh, went to the same doctor uh, the surgical teams and one went on to live a normal recovered completely living a normal life and the other suffered severely in his in his mental maturity and his in his spirit and his physical mental growth one needed counseling and fell apart emotionally and, and, and started blaming everything. The other one stood on the word, refused to be moved by what she saw, what she felt, how it felt, how it looked. Stood on this, this rock, confessing the word of healing. Went on in, in complete restoration. Now here's what you need to understand. For people that keep bouncing around, looking for the perfect minister, going to miracle meetings, nothing wrong with that. But when you're just nothing but a Holy Ghost fire truck running around trying to find everywhere that God's moving, you need to be rooted and grounded in a church and rooted and grounded in the Word. And for everybody that's running around trying to get a new touch, you just need to get serious where you're at and live this as your pastor and your, and your pastoral staff and your Sunday school teachers are, are teaching it without compromise. Both these women had the same pastor. Both these women went to the same church. So the pastor, the teaching, the church atmosphere is part of it. But it's this right here. Having ears to hear, right heart attitude and soil, and being a doer of what is being preached taught and proclaimed that's all the difference in the world right there now listen to this one that did not make a quality decision in his life to be a doer of the word that as it came into his life bless god i'm going to live it and we're going to go to this next step here in just a second we covered last week now watch this very closely hallelujah and everyone that heareth these sins of mine and do them uh well, let's back up to verse 25. I missed that. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on the rock. The life was committed and established in every area on the word of God. Amen. And on Jesus Christ. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which builds his house upon the sand. Doesn't mean he's not saved, but he's just not doing what he knows to do. If we, if we know to do right and do it not, it becomes sin for us. We miss the mark with God, and we become exposed and vulnerable in the spirit realm to Satan and his tactics and tools where we should not have openings or any vulnerability at all. Amen? Amen. Now look what happens to this man. And doeth them not, he shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Well, I need to go over here for my career. I need to do this. I want that woman. And he makes all his life's decisions based on what he sees, what he hears, how it feels, how it looks, and what he wants. He lives life his way. Saved, but making all the decisions his way. Doesn't 
take this as the guiding principle? Does it take this as the instructions of God? Does it take this as the safety barriers? Does it take this as his counsel? Refers to this in nothing. This is something we do on Sunday. I'm saved, but don't get so fanatical about this. Well, that's a foolish man. Now, both these categories, just like these women, are going to suffer the same rain, the same wind, the same flood, the same attacks in life as the other. The difference is what they do with it. Amen? The word in Mark 4 and Luke 8 doesn't change. The sower, the one doing the preaching, doesn't change. Those aren't the factors. Well, if I had a better preacher, I could, I could be successful. No. To a level that's correct, you've got to get out of denominational boundaries and chains and limitations. Come to a word church that teaches the uncompromised word. But once you've done that, Pastor Dan Thompson, word of man, a word of faith man. Two different outcomes in these lives. So the sword didn't change. The word didn't change. The difference was what? The soil. The heart attitude determines how much you'll live it. And if you don't live it, and I mean live it in every aspect of your life, your life's house is going to fail. Your life's foundation is on your opinions and your wisdom, and you are no match for the storms of hell. Amen? So why do good people suffer? Everybody's going to suffer. You will not escape trials and tribulations in life. Jesus said that. He said, uh, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen? So as long as I'm with Christ, in Christ, walking with Christ, building my life with Christ, I'm a world overcomer. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's going to be, right now we're in the middle of a, of, a, of a snowstorm. Lost people are in the same snowstorm. Believers are in the same snowstorm. Word of faith pe people are in the same snowstorm. We're all going to experience storms, but the outcome is based on what we do with the seed that comes into our hearts. Amen? Say it with me. The storms of life are going to come to all humanity. You cannot avoid that. What you can avoid is the outcome. What you have a determination in is what you will do with Christ in that storm. Then we looked over here in Genesis. Very quickly, Genesis chapter 15, verse 8, talking about God cutting his covenant with Abraham. And right in the presence of God, Satan came, the fowls of, same fowls of the air, in Mark 4 and Luke 8. As the sea's going forth, Satan goes forth. He goes forth with Don... Folks, I can't even tell you how many times routinely you start a service and people start this. Or, or, or they'll start talking. You ask them, what were you talking about? Well, I, I couldn't remember I closed the garage door. Couldn't remember, do I have to take the kids to school? Every, every, it doesn't have to even be a major store. But the thoughts, the fouls of the air could just come in your thoughts and imaginations and steal the word that was meant for you to get a, a revelation of God in an area of your life and you missed it because a bird came in and distracted you. That's why I'm so strict in our services. We don't have any nonsense. We don't have kids running around. We don't have people talking back for it. We're not drinking coffee, eating donuts. We're, we're locked in. We're not here for anything but the Word. One word from God can open up understanding that changes and put your whole life on another course, a course of victory, a course of success, a course of power and authority and dominion. Amen? I mean, one... just. We're very serious about protecting the atmosphere so that at least as I'm spending the word, sending the word forth, people's hearts, I can't control, but I can control the atmosphere from my mouth to their hearts. So we don't put up with anything that's going to distract or interfere with that process of sowing. But Jesus put it this way. He said, it's the little foxes, the little things. It's the little foxes that creep in and spoil the vine. 
that spoil your harvest. You go out, I should have a bunch of grapes. Where'd they go? Well, they got eaten. Well, I didn't see any cows. There weren't any cows. There wasn't any fornication. I didn't see any robbers. There were no robbers. There, there was no murder in your heart. Well, the, who ate them? Oh, little little foxes crept in underneath the vines where you couldn't even see them. They're hiding under. Your, they're hiding in the middle of your harvest. Hallelujah. Little foxes just eat all night long. What what is that? Unforgiveness in your heart. Cares of the world. Deceitfulness of riches. Well, I wonder if I'm going to get that promotion. And I really need to go over here and get that job because without it, I won't, I won't get that extra uh, training in my resume when God's called you over here. Is that a sin? No. But it's a fox. It's the little decisions we make, the little things that we allow that can destroy our whole harvest with God. A lot of what's destroying people that good people, Christian people, Holy Ghost tongue-talking people. Well, why ain't I getting ahead, little foxes? You refuse to stay out of strife with your wife. You refuse to understand that every time you start arguing and go to bed angry, they're, chew they're chewing on your harvest all night long. Well, God understands. No, that's an excuse for not lifting up the vines and protecting what God's promised in your life. You've got to make a quality decision right now. If I'm going to get the full benefit of the Word of God in my life, I have got to get rid of luxuries that I've allowed myself in the past. I've got to get rid of the luxury of losing my temper. I've got to get rid of the luxury of gossip and murmuring. I've got to get rid of, we'll get into that here in just a little bit. I've got to get rid of the luxury, the little foxes of cheating on my taxes. I got to get rid of the luxury of of talking one way at work and during the day and talking another way at church. You got to get rid of all the so-called Christian luxuries of being saved on Sunday and living any way you want during the week. And met much of it, much of it. Here's a perfect example. Well, pastor, I I missed church cuz I had to take the boys to baseball practice. And then they missed next Sunday. Well, where were you? Well, we had to take the girls to ballerina practice. And where were you? So they're showing up maybe once a, once a month, once every two months. Well, what are you doing? Well, we got ballet practice. We got baseball practice. We got choir practice for the church glee, or the uh, uh, school glee club. We got this. And the cares, of, not one bit of them is an outward sin. But it eats away from your kingdom relationship and opens up your life to the little, not even things that you would recognize as vile sin, just chewing away God's blessings in your life. Amen? So you gotta, we got to come to a... Do I want a house that's not going to fall? Do I want a lifestyle that bless God when I find a promise of God in my life? It can, I, can make, I can loose my faith and see it come to pass. Do I want to be the person that stands up and says, look what God's done by faith. He'll do the same thing for you. Or do I want to be the one always sitting, watching somebody else be blessed and used of God? Those are all quality decisions explained in Luke 8 and Mark 4. Amen? And then we saw here in Genesis that right in the presence of God, here come the, here come the demons. Here come the distractions to eat up the covenant agreement sacrifice between you and God. This is your covenant agreement right here. This is the Lord cut open, laid open in front of you and God as a covenant sacrifice that you can enter into God's best. Amen? You got to protect it. You got it. God did not fight off the devil for Abraham. Abraham had to pick up a stick, had to pick up the rod of authority and beat back the adversary in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Amen? So you've got to be able to fight for what you want from God. If you're not willing to fight for it, you'll never live it. Let me say that again. If you're not willing to fight for the things, the treasures, the promises, the covenant blessings you find in this word, to keep them long enough for them to manifest in your life, if you're not willing to get in the fight 
and fight till it shows up, you'll never have it. Because Satan's coming. Circumstances are coming. Storms of life are coming. you got to make up your mind. This doesn't fall into your life like ripe cherries out of a tree. I used to hear Brother Papa Hagen say that. You don't just read it and, well, just, okay, God, now just rain it down in my life. No, Jesus Christ paid the price so that as you find the promise, you can stand on the promise, you can claim the promise, and you can get the promise in your life. But you got to fight. you got to fight the good fight of faith and use your authority until it grows up and manifests. And Oh, look, there! wow, there's that car I prayed for. There's that new house we prayed for. There's the new church building we prayed for. And let me point out one more thing here real quick before we move on to this area of battle. If you get if you got it in your mind that, well, I fought two or three times and it should be here, you don't put a time limit. I, I, I remember one time Brother Hagen was talking and he, he he said this, he said, so many people come up and say, well, how long is it going to take? Because it's going to take as long until you see, see it manifest in your life. And it's like the teapot. The longer you sit and watch, when, 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 how long, how long, how long, it'll, it'll seem like it'll take forever. If you claim it, confess it, as it rises up in your heart, and go on and set your hand to the plow to do things for God and be a blessing to others, it'll seem like it takes no time at all. I remember when we had uh, uh, vision boards at our other location over in Vickery Meadows before the Lord moved us over to Farmer's Branch. We had a, 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 I did a service about vision boards, and everybody, everybody made, well, almost everybody made vision boards. Well, Pastor Darlene and I made a vision board, and, and we put our vision, what we wanted from God, what we were going to release our faith for. And Pastor Allen made a vision board, and many, many other people in the church. Well, folks, that was just a matter of just, just a few years ago. I, I don't think it was more than two years ago. And on the, our vision board, we had a picture of a home that we wanted. Not a, a type of home. Well, folks, it's been less than three years. I'm standing in that home right now. Did people's tithe increase? Oh, Lord, no. Yeah, actually, it went backwards. Did, did people just start mailing you money from other... No? No? Well, did, did, did you inherit something? No? Well, yeah, I inherited something, but not from the natural realm. I... Wrote the vision. I made it plain. We agreed in faith. Based on the word, whatsoever you set your hand to will prosper. God will give you the desires of your heart. God desires that you have all good things richly to enjoy. But number one, I am a seeker first of the kingdom of God. I build my house on the rock. Number two, I didn't get up every day and look out my front window. Is there a check in the mail? Is, is, there, is, is somebody coming down the street with the UPS truck and a package with a check in it? I, didn't, I went about the Father's business. Went to church every day, fasted every week to be a blessing to God's people. And it seemed like in no time, here it is. So you've got to be able to fight over your covenant promises, but in the middle of that fight, one of the best ways to fight is be about the Father's business. Be about the Father's business. And that teapot will be whistling God's blessings into your life in no time at all. But as long as you're waiting, sitting around, soaking, souring, and complaining about how long is this going to take, it seems like it'll take forever if it ever shows up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't hit a lick. I'll tell you, I've never been in a fight where I was able to hit somebody one time and the fight's over. I'm just not that big and bad. Been in a lot of them. Every one of them I hated being in. That, to me, there's no winners in fights. I always came out bruised, cut, bloody, and hurt. Sore for a week. Now, people like Pastor Tony, he's so big, I'm sure he could just pick a lot of people up and throw them in the corner. I couldn't do that. I've never been in a fight where I thought I was a winner. I, I was just a survivor. Hey, man. I mean, if, I'm, if I got a bloody nose and the other guy says I give, well, that's good, but I, I didn't enjoy it. So, 
You're going to fight the fight and swing the sword of the Spirit and stand your ground until the victory is yours. You don't count how many times you pray. You don't count how many times you confess the word. You don't look at your watch how long the battle's taking. All that will prolong it. And you, listen to me, that means that half of your mind is in the flesh, half your mind's in the spirit, and a double-minded man, what? Receives nothing from God. Why? Because you're distracted, you'll become weary, you'll faint. We'll look at that in just a minute. And you do not receive what is rightfully yours, but you've got to take the right steps to possess it. Oh, hallelujah. I wish the congregation was here. You should be shouting right now. Amen? All right. So now I want to look at a couple of things. Look over here at Jeremiah. <clears throat> Two principles that I want you to write down, document them in your notebook, make a note in your Bible. Never, never, never forget these two things. Number one, so it sows the word, it comes into your heart, you claim it, you're going to start living it. You're going to start confessing for it to manifest. You're going to keep your soil right in this atm atmosphere of love, forgiveness, faith, and protecting and watching the horizon and all the small things in your life to make sure Satan does not get in where he shouldn't be and start chewing up what you're believing God for. My God, I wish I could explain to you how many times even Pastor TC has gotten so close to the victory, so close to the there it is and possessing the promise and something happens and I blow it at the last minute. There's nothing worse than believing God and standing in faith clear up to the point that it's almost yours and then you mess it up with your mouth, with an attitude, or you get tired. Oh, I give up. You have no idea how close you are to your victory. You cannot look at how you feel. You, you get up and I walk by faith. I walk in the Spirit. I don't ask my body, do you want to go to church today? I tell my body, you are a vessel. You're like my car. I'm going to start you up. I'm going to get in you, and you're going to take me to church. I don't ask my car, how do you feel? I don't ask my body how I feel. I don't ask people how do I feel. I do what God tells me to do. Amen? Uh, is there times where I feel? That, folks, there's times this body doesn't want to do nothing but stay home and eat Twinkies. Period. But I don't go by what I feel like. I don't go by what it looks like. I don't go by... You certainly don't go by, you know, whether everybody's praising you or bad-mouthing you. You've got to go by faith. And faith has nothing to do with the circumstances of life. Faith changes the circumstances of life. Amen? So get this, in, get this locked down in your spirit very quickly. It'll help your, your faith walk. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11. It's talking to Jeremiah, telling Jeremiah his calling, explaining his purpose in life. And then he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? He's, he's training the prophet how to see in the spirit realm. Oh, hallelujah. And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Rods are always a, a de depiction of authority and dominion. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast seen well. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted you to see in the Spirit. For I will hasten my word to perform it. Oh, hallelujah. Write that down in your spirit. Write it down in your notebook. Write it down in your Bible. God begins to move immediately to perform his word. The delay is not from the kingdom of heaven. Remember when Daniel was praying? 21 days later, the... The warrior general angel Michael shows up. Actually, I think it was Gabriel. Shows up and says, The day you started fasting and praying, I was released by God from heaven on your behalf. But it took me a while to fight through the resistance. Write it down. Never forget it. God's not the reason things are delayed. God's not holding back from us. What is the key factor here? He moves, he moves quickly. What? What? 
to perform his word. Now, you've got, you got to get a revelation of that real fast. But let me read you this out of the Amplified. We're going to look at some powerful stuff today. I might preach for three hours. Ain't nobody sitting here in front of me to get tired. So I, uh, as long as the battery's running, I can preach. <laughs> I like that. That'll work. Are you ready? Listen to it in the Amplified. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? I said, I see a branch or a shoot of an almond tree, the emblem, the emblem of alertness and activity blossoming in late winter. Then the Lord said unto me, listen to this, folks. You have seen well for, I, oh, glory to God, this ought to just light your fire. You have seen well for I am alert this is God talking. I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. There you go. So what's God's position? When you find the word, you confess the word, and you're praying for the word to manifest, God's from heaven alert and active, watching over what? His word. And once he sees his word, he moves immediately to make it happen. Wow. 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 Say it with me. God is not holding back. The delay is not with God. It's not the kingdom of heaven too slow. What's he looking for? The word. He doesn't hasten to move at all. Your emotions. Oh, I'm just really sick and tired. He's not moving at all. As a matter of fact, you've heard me say this before. Most people don't pray. They just gather... Uh, at a, a point of time to complain and fret some in front of God. What does God hasten immediately? He's looking for opportunity to spring into action when somebody speaks the word. Oh, hallelujah. So you got to know what the word says. you got to have it in your heart. It's got to be sown in here. And you got to speak for whatsoever man saith he shall have. How do I know I shall have it? Because God's going to move immediately to empower the word, to prosper in the thing. And we'll look at that as in the next verse. God wants to move quickly for you. But how can two walk together lest they agree? God agrees with his word, not your opinion. Well, if you want my idea, Father, I think you just need to do that. He's not moving at all. He moves to perform his word. He moves to perform his word. And how does he move? Quickly. Quickly. Hallelujah. So where's the delay? My attitudes, my actions, my, my, my dropping the ball here, neglect here. As long as the word is out there, as long as I'm speaking the word, as long as I'm protecting the word with the right soil, the right actions, the, Engaged in spiritual warfare and engaged in the things of the kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom of God. As long as all that's correct, God's moving, God's moving, God's moving, God's moving. Now, folks, I know people that have believed God for houses 20, 30, 40 years later. I know, I know people that are standing on... I know a guy that's been believing God for a wife for 20 years. By, by the time it shows up, she's going to have gray hair. Why? Because he won't mature. He won't grow up. He won't be consistent enough that God can trust him with a good one of his good daughters. <laughs> That's a whole other subject, but it's good teaching. Amen? God's not the one holding back. But he won't plant in bad soil. He won't produce in bad soil. He won't establish where the hedge is down. Why? Because he's just going to give it to the devil if he does. If you're not able to protect it, willing to protect it, keeping the atmosphere correct, walking godly, walking holy, walking in forgiveness and love and authority and dominion and faith, he's just going to give resources that Satan's going to come in, eat up, and take away. But you speak the word, you stand on the word, you defend the word, you refuse to compromise on the word, God's moving, God's moving, God's moving, God's moving. Amen. He hastens his word to perform it. Number two, look over here at Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Somebody says that's good teaching, Pastor. That's good. I could hear you. Amen. 
Isaiah 55, I want you to look with me. Glory to God. Let's start very familiar, verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your, your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Anybody with a, just a little bit of sense should be able to agree with that. Amen? Now listen to this. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, which we're experiencing right now, and returneth not hither, you don't see snow going up, you don't see rain going back up. It comes down and stays for a reason. Oh, hallelujah. It comes down and stays for a reason. Why is he using this analogy? Watch. It, and returns not hither, but waters the earth. Say this with me. Rain is for a purpose. Snow is for a purpose, and it doesn't return to heaven. It stays here to fulfill its purpose. That's what he's trying to teach us. So what one person calls a storm, somebody else might call a blessing. I've told people this, and I mean it for years. It's, <clears throat> I don't know why. I've never, I'm 67 years old. I've never been able to figure this out. I don't get tired of rain. When I was a kid, I'd go out and play in it. When I was a, a, a little bit older kid, I put on a raincoat and just go out and walk around. I just, there's something about rain. I've always loved it. I mean, I could be ankle deep in water. It's raining so much. I just don't get tired of it. Very strange, but I love rain. I love snow. Snow's different. It gets cold. My bones get cold and, and, and it starts hurting, but uh, I love snow. So what one person calls a curse, I, I, I love it. What's the difference? Your heart attitude and your actions and your ability to see what's going on because of it. Amen? Now this is going to come out here in just a minute. Well, one person goes, oh my God, it's raining. I'm going out here, praise God, it's raining. What's James say? I'll go ahead and quote it to you. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations and trials. So when it's raining, I'm, I'm going, praise God, I love rain. Other people say, I hate this stinking rain. Well, they're not counting it joy. They don't see that there's a spiritual purpose for rain. And if nothing else, it should be testing you to be able to rejoice in what your flesh don't like. And until you can do that and no longer move by circumstances of life, the word still choked off and, and hindered in its growth in your heart. Amen, that's good. Are you ready? But watereth the earth and maketh to bring forth bud. What's rain for? Cause things to grow. What are trials and tribulations for? Cause things to grow. Glory to God. That it might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. How many of us confess that for a 30, 60, and 100 fold of return? But the other side of that spiritual principle is this. You'll never progress 30, 60, and 100 if you can't stand in rain. If you don't allow trials and tribulations, circumstances of life to make you stronger and better, you'll never progress in the budding of the kingdom in your life. Hallelujah. Now let's get down to where we really need to go but gives uh, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It, I underline this in my Bible. Never forget this. This is the second principle. God doesn't hold back. He moves immediately on the word. Here's the second principle. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So if I find by his stripes I was healed, I speak it out of my mouth in faith as claiming it into my body, God hastens immediately to, to perform the word, and it will not come. It doesn't fall to the ground. The word never fails. It will accomplish the thing God meant for it to perform. 
So God's not holding back, and the word never fails. Lock that in your life. Lock it in your heart. Lock it in your mind. Write it down. Etch it down. Chisel it in. Never forget it. God's not holding back. The word never fails. God agrees with the word. God empowers the word. The word's got to go forth. The word's got to produce. It will never change. So if it's not coming to pass, God's not holding it back from me, and the word's not too weak to work. It never fails. It always does exactly what God said it would do. Amen. Boy, that's powerful. That'll take all, the revelation of those two scriptures will take all demonic accusation, uncertainty, suspicion of, well, I wonder if it's going to, it works for some people, but not me. All that garbage got to stop. It'll work for everybody that works it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good teaching. Now look over here at James 4, 7. Now these next five scriptures I'm going to cover are absolute life and death serious fundamental proofs, fundamental issues, fundamental truths that you absolutely have to get in your heart before we go any further into the kingdom of God. Sip my coffee. I don't have any water up here with me. Hallelujah. James chapter 4. Now I'm not going to expound as long on all of these, but one of these we're going to look at very, very, very close because it's one of the major keys that are knocking people out of God's blessings in these, in these last days. James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. Man, I miss my church. I wish you were all out here in front of me. But I know you're going to watch this. Hit the like button. Leave a comment and tell the whole world uh, that, that you were part of this service today. Amen? James chapter 4, verse 7. Very, very, very fundamental but extremely powerful truth. <clears throat> Are you ready? Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Well, let me read it, and then we'll let the Holy Ghost talk about it. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. All right. Well, I tried that, Pastor, and it got worse. You're not in a fight swinging once to win. You swing until you win. You confess until you win. You resist until you win. This word that never fails, God hastens to perform it. It will accomplish what God said it will work, what it will accomplish. Says two things here, two spiritual truths. They're absolutely critical. There are so many people today living loosey-goosey, hallelujah, what's it to you, greasy grace lives, Wondering how come bad things are happening to them. You cannot resist what you allow. You have got to get that principle locked in. Until I submit to God, I have no spiritual authority to resist the devil. Oh, thank you, Pastor Allen. Bless his heart. Receive a prophet's reward. He just brought a cup of water to me. It says, he that gives a, a glass of water to a prophet shall... Receive a prophet's reward. And I mean that. Receive a reward of the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Number one, I've got to submit to God. You can't resist the devil unsubmitted and rebellious to God. Why has this happened to me? Folks, I can't even tell you as a pastor how many times I've had people say, I don't understand why this is going on. Then you talk to them for a while. And, well, this window's open. That window's open. This back door is wide open. You go to their house. There's no peace. Yelling and screaming. Kids running around. Clothes all over the place. Toys. All, absolute upheaval in the spirit realm. Emotional realm. Yelling back and forth. 
and they're wondering why their finances aren't blossoming. They're wondering why their bodies aren't being healed. They're not submitting to God in anything that's primary in their lives. And they're wondering, why can't I resist the devil? You re, you're, only allowed, you're only able to resist the enemy to the level you cooperate with, your, with leadership. I can't do this to God and think I have authority and dominion over demons. I can't do what? I can't even do this to God, act like I don't know, and think I have authority over demons. That's called willful ignorance, and it's a sin. And I've had them come to say that to me. I was better off when I didn't know all this word stuff. I just want to sit in the church and be safe and happy. It, I've never seen it work. So I can't do like the monkeys, this. I can't do this. I, I, can't do, I can't act like I don't know, live any way I want, and keep the demons out of my house. Keep the demons off my body. Keep the demons off my foot. Submit to God. And now, at the same time, I can't just submit to God. you got to actively resist the devil. you got to actively resist the spirits of temptation. you got to ab absolutely resist demons that whisper against the Word of God while you're believing it. So, spiritual principle number one in, in this section of serious fundamentals. Whose side are you going to live on? You can't submit to God and do what all your carnal or non-believing friends want you to do. Run around, clubbing, hopping, dancing, sleeping around. You're throwing doors wide open to the devil. Whose side are you going to be on? Choose you this day. You got to, When you choose, then you, you're going to submit to God. You're going to resist it. I don't do that no more. I'm not listening to that no more. I'm not living like that anymore. Amen? So that's... Number one. Number two, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Fundamental but extremely serious and powerful truths that you have to get locked in in this spiritual battle of protecting your heart attitude, allowing the word to grow, not blaming God, and looking in your own house, looking for foxes, and having an eye to resist, fight, and fight until you win against the adversaries of hell. Amen? 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 Why? Because they're coming to steal. Whether they steal or not is up to you, not God. Dear God, I hope you hear that. Whether they steal or not is up to you, not God. Well, God knows where I live. If he wants me to be healed, he'll come visit me. Not a word, not a word of that's biblical. Not a word of that's activating the action of heaven and God on your behalf. Not a word of that is stopping sickness and disease at the door. Why? Because it's non-scriptural. By his stripes, you were already healed. Now you fight to defend your covenant promise. You bind the devil. You submit to God by submitting to his word. Amen? All right. Ephesians 6. Are you ready? Look with me at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? He's going to tell you here in just a minute that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the plots, the plans, the devices of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's the truth you need to get settled in your head. Does the devil... It, here's where you... Folks, listen. Here's where you get tripped up. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. My wife's standing here cussing me to my face. Looks like flesh and blood to me. Yeah, it does. But you're still wrong. See this handkerchief? Look at it. It's nothing. I take my hands off of it and it falls to the ground dead. But it can have an illusion of life with me in it, moving it. Wow, look at that handkerchief. It looks like, looks like a Casper the Friendly Ghost floating through my house. But why? Because of what's going on in it. So you think you're wrestling against flesh and blood when your wife's cussing you, your husband's being ugly, your boss is a jerk. But it's a spirit moving through them like a sock puppet that's motivating that action. And as long as you keep addressing your warfare with the flesh face to face, instead of just keeping a spirit of peace and going into another room and taking authority and dominion over the demon's 
animating them, you'll never have victory. Your battle's not with people. Your battle's with demons motivating people. Your battle's not Democrat and Republican. It's demonic deception. Your, your battle is certainly not white, black, Asian, or Mexican. It's spirits. It's a spirit of division. A house divided cannot stand that causes racism. It's a spirit, folks. It's a demon from hell that promotes one race over another, even if you're proud of who you are. That's the first steps of demonic activity. You get proud of who you are in Christ and Christ alone. Or you will always evaluate yourself above your brother of another color. Your battle's not with a culture on earth. Your battle's with a culture in the spirit. Your battle's not with flesh and blood. It's with principalities and powers. Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Watch this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, because of this, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Oh, hallelujah. So until I do all to stand, I'm not going to stand. I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified. It's going to light you up. Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, I tried that. It didn't work. That's a lie from hell. The word is hastened by God to perform exactly what God said it will do. God said, I'll move quickly to make sure it happens. Don't you dare say you tried it and it didn't work. You, you hit it a lick and you didn't work. You swung one time in this fight and it didn't work. You gave two or three good offerings in your entire Christian life and prosperity didn't come. No, you've got to live it as a lifestyle, your house. Now, are you ready to get this in the Amplified? You don't like it. <laughs> well, you may not like it, but I do. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 in the Amplified. Are you ready? Therefore, put on the whole complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground. Boy, how many people just can't stand in one place long enough to get something from God? They're up and down, in and out, happy and sad week to week in their spiritual walk with God. <laughs> You're able to stand your ground on the evil day, the evil day of danger, and having done all that the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place, stand firmly in your place. In other words, you've got to do everything that this battle demands for you to not be moved. you got to do everything that this battle demands for you not to be moved. Hallelujah. Puts a whole different face on it, doesn't it? We hope so. Can't wait for it to take. Have you done everything that this particular battle demands for you to have victory? I'm sorry to say most people... Sadly, sadly, do not. They'll pray once or twice, quote a couple of scriptures, go to counseling, and then they just let it go. Well, how long do I stand? Until the battle, the victory is yours. Until the victory is yours. Until the there it is manifests in your life. What do you do? You do everything this evil battle is set against you, demands to be done, for you to have victory in this battle. Hallelujah. So here's the next question. You have to be 100% committed to this working in your life. Whose side are you going to be on? And are you going to have a total life's committal to it? If you don't, 
it won't work. Is my whole life going to be committed to this? Jesus said, set your hand to the plow and don't look back. A double-minded man can't receive anything. Your whole life's got to be in this. Any preacher that told you that you can just get all this stuff because he's anointed and he's, he's a prophet and he's gifted and he can preach, that's a lie from hell. You've got to be able to stand in it. You've got to be able to do everything this battle demands be done to get victory in this battle. Whew. Praise God. Amen? All right. Now look at Galatians 6. Oh, thank you for this water, Pastor Allen. Galatians chapter 6. I don't know about you folks. I wish I could see you, but I'm just, whew, I preach myself happy. The presence of God's all over me. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For what? In due season. In due season, we, this say might, maybe sometimes here and there, reap. In due season, you shall reap. It's going to work. You shall get results. This word shall produce. It shall come to pass. You shall reap in due season. You shall reap in due season. You shall reap if we faint not. If you don't get weak, weary, and give up. Hallelujah. So what's principle number three? You got to make a quality decision. I start this battle. I release the word. I stand on the word, I believe the word, and I defend the word until I see the harvest, until I reap what I started praying for. And until then, I don't care how I feel, I don't care how it looks, I don't care what goes on around me, I don't care if I show up next Sunday at church, oh I do, I love you, but if I show up and the only people there with me, standing with me, believing God with me is Alan and Darlene, which is how I start. I'm going to open your Bibles and preach like there's 300 people out there. I never give up. Pastor Dad taught me over 35 years ago, and it, to this day it resonates in my spirit. One of the, it doesn't sound too powerful to the carnal, casual ear, but man, it went into me. It grabbed hold of me. And it, I'll tell you right now, that word spoken to the congregation, but it was like a, an arrow that went straight into me. An arrow of life that went straight in me with a seed of God attached to the head of it. And this is what he said. Are you ready? Never quit. Never quit. Never quit. That's how spirit did for me. When I felt God, I remember I heard echoing in my spirit. Never quit. When I tripped over here, I heard echoing in my spirit. Never quit. When God said, TC, I still love you, I heard God say, I will not quit. Over and over again in the pitfalls and the scars and the wounds and the bruises of living life for Christ and the falling down and getting up, echoing in my spirit, never quit, never quit, never quit, never quit. You got to get quit out of your mindset. You got to get quit out of your vocabulary. you got to get quit out of your very consciousness. Why? The word says right here. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Number one, what are you doing well? Are you living holy? Are you submitting to God, resisting the devil? Are you living by faith? Are you tithing? Are you giving? Are you witnessing? Are you doing just the works of righteousness? Not for righteousness, but the, what a righteous person does because they're new creatures now. Are you, hub, are you hopping around, clubbing, barring, slipping, sliding, gliding, playing the pimp, all your nonsense? You'll never make it. You'll never make it. This will never work in your life. You can go find a preacher that will look, look past all that nonsense. Oh, I prophesy over you. He, he's a player. He's a pretender. He's a performer. I'm telling you what the uncompromised word of God says that I've seen work 35 plus years of my life. You've got to underline this in your spirit. Settle it before God and for, before hell and before man. 
I'll never quit. In Jesus Christ's name, I'll never quit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number one, whose side you're going to be on? Decide it. Number two, you got to be committed to this stuff with building your life on it committed. Number three, you have to get a quality decision. I don't care how tired I get, how, how dismal it looks, I will not draw back. I will not get tired of serving God. I will not quit in Jesus Christ's name. Amen? All right. Now look over here at James chapter 1. Now, <clears throat> wrapping it up here in just a minute. James chapter 1. Glory to God. James chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 2. Well, let's just go ahead and read verse 1 just because I like it. James, a servant of God... And of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the body of Christ. My brethren, count it all joy. This is a, what's going on. Consider it joyful. Look at what happened. Consider it joyful. Does that mean you just praise God for every demonic attack in your life? You don't praise him for the attack. You praise him for the opportunity in the attack. God will work all things to my good. What Satan meant for evil, God will turn to my good. I don't praise him for the evil, but I praise that he's right in the middle of it with me and it's going to turn to my blessing. Count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, bad translation literally means this. Count it all joy when you fall into trials. When you, try, when you fall into tests in your life. Temptation sounds like, come over here and kiss me, and come over here and cheat. Let's gamble. No, that's not what it's... Well, that's part of it, but it's really talking about just tests. Testing your mettle. Testing your commitment. Testing your love for God. He's testing you. What are you doing that? Well... Uh... I'm not serving God. I, did, I used to do God, but this happened. How many people do you know so wounded by the devil that now they're sitting at home accusing God because they didn't know how to do this? Folks, I told you how I broke my neck. I mean, my neck was broken. I couldn't pick up like this glass. I couldn't pick up this glass without ungodly pain going all the way through my body. For a period of four months, I slept an hour a night, if that. Couldn't find any comfort anywhere, anyway. Wasn't going to go to a doctor. One, I didn't have insurance. Two, I didn't have the money. And three, I was going to stand by the Word of God. And in all of it, every night, excruciating pain, tears running down my eyes, speaking to my body, resisting the devil, and out of my very being, one thing would keep coming up, God. This is not your fault, and I will not accuse you in Jesus' name. I will not accuse you, God. You are faithful. Your word, you are hastening your word to perform it. I am healed by the stripes of my Lord Jesus Christ. And then one day I'm standing in the shower, and I just wasn't, I was praising God. I wasn't thinking about anything, and all of a sudden I turned my head and went, <sighs> clear down to my tailbone. I, went, oh, I almost thought I was getting, getting ready to fall. I went, Oh, wow. I turned my head this way and popped some more. And it's still, still not comfortable. Within three weeks, every symptom gone. Why? I didn't refuse to quit. I was in the battle to win. And I will not allow myself to get weary and start accusing God. Amen? Count it all joy. How can I count it joy? Because I know God's still moving. I know God's word works. I'm not without hope. I know that this is going to make me stronger in faith and patience and love and kindness and the virtues of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. I know I will win. I count it joy because I know something that somebody without Christ doesn't win, doesn't know. They get in a car wreck, they get injured, they're without hope outside of the doctor's. 
And when the doctor says there's nothing we can do, they have lost all hope. I can count it joy because Jesus Christ is my healer. God is moving on my behalf. God is moving in the spirit realm. Whether I can see it or feel it, I'm full of joy because I know this will work and be turned to my good and the glory of God in Jesus' name. Now, if I suffer and fall, if I suffer and give up, if I suffer and accuse God, that's not going to give glory to God. That's going to be victory, a feather in Satan's cap. So you got to, the, number four, you got to keep the right spiritual attitude in your heart. How many of us get into battles, and boy, you can watch them come into church. Their lips are clear down to the floor. Their shoulders are all slumped over. They're there, but everybody and every demon in hell knows, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm so beat down. I don't know if I can make it another. And I'm not, I'm not picking on them. But you are not on victory ground. You are not on in a hard attitude of joy. You are not in faith. I don't care what you say. Every devil of hell. But I'm in pain. Be in pain with a smile on your face. How you doing, brother? Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. And everybody knows you're in pain, but everybody knows you're standing in faith. Every demon of hell knows you're not accusing God. Every vile spirit that brought that on you knows their day's number. This is going to break to your victory, to their defeat, and to God's glory. Whoo! Hallelujah, I feel that. Glory to God, I felt that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, I have to keep the right heart attitude in the battles of life. I can confess the right thing with the wrong attitude and I get zero results. Why? I'm a double-minded man. Hallelujah. I didn't say you're not hurting. I didn't say there wasn't pain in losing a loved one. I didn't say there's not pain in your body. But that's not your spirit. That's not your heart. You keep your heart right, your spirit, your, your spirit right, you keep the joy of the Lord right. Your body's got to submit. Circumstances have to submit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we're going to get to the last one. Open your Bibles. To, well, right in my Bible, it's just right up above it. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, folks, this is probably the most vicious, vile, if... Now, not everybody all over the internet, but many of the people here at New Day Christian Center received a forwarded uh, email that I forwarded to Pastor Daryl, Pastor Tony, asked them to forward to everybody, forwarded it to Pastor Allen, asked him to forward it, and hopefully all the ladies got it also, where Pastor, uh, well, Apostle Terry Bahumas in Australia uh, numerous churches in Pakistan under his ministry pointed to Jesus ministry churches and he had one man that was faithful brother Isaac that he was requesting prayer for and the backstory is this man was taking on the role of bishop in Pakistan because there was four or five churches that Terry put him in oversight over well We'll come back to that story in just a minute, but I want to read, read this scripture. Unbelievably powerful. Listen to this. Now, you'll almost never hear this taught. You'll almost never hear anybody expound on this to the destruction of many in the body of Christ. And the ones that the reason they shy away from this is because well you look like you look like a cult leader. No, it's absolutely Bible, and it's a Bible principle that's so serious, it can determine your victory in almost every battle of your life. And I mean that I can't even tell you how many times I've seen this acted out in in real life. And we're ta we're talking about it right now, and we're talking about it in people in churches all over America. 
on the on the on the trash heap of life because they would not stop violating this. Verse 17, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them. We don't even like that word. Don't you tell me to obey. That's why you don't have any marriage counseling anymore, seminars anymore. You don't hear people talking about the virtuous woman. We got an eight tape series on how to be a godly wife. They're not out there. Why? Because Jezebel's so strong, they won't even allow preachers to preach it anymore. <laughs> I knew you'd like that, but it's true. Obey them that have the rule over. Well, you don't rule over me. Well, that's to your destruction. You think it's bad in the King James? We're going to dive into this for a little bit. It's going to shock you. And I don't say this arrogantly. I'm still, I have to get an edge on because there's such a demonic host of hell against pastors all over America. You don't ever address this. Why? Because you'll, you'll put up a barrier where I can't destroy people in your church anytime I want now. Hallelujah. Obey them that have rule over you. And submit yourselves. Well, I, what do you mean submit to a pastor? I know. It's been, this rebellious spirit's been taught so long that when you teach the truth, it looks like some kind of a deception. That's why this is always the truth. This is your standard. This is your compass. This is what's right or wrong, whether you've ever heard it or not. Amen? Watch. Submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, answer to God, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Submit to your pastors, for your pastors have oversight and rule over your souls. They watch out for you in the spirit realm. And do it with a good attitude so that the pastor can answer to God with joy. Yeah, she's a member of my congregation, Father, and she's such a blessing. It's such a joy to be his pastor. Not with grief, because if I have to come to God and say, God, you got to talk to this person. They're just nothing but resisting, dragging, a drain, fighting. We don't drive people out. But when a pastor got to go to God with sorrow in his heart over you, everything he preaches has no profit in your life. Your spiritual walk is unprofitable. Well, I don't know. I know. Hang on. Let's read it out of the Amplified. This will clarify it. This will shock you. Are you ready? Pastor Allen, answer for everybody. Are you ready? Yes. Listen to this, verse 17 in the Amplified. Obey your spiritual leaders. There you go. That clarifies it. It's talking about your pastors. Obey your spiritual leaders. Submit to them. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> Continually recognizing their authority over you. That's what it means in the Greek. For they are constantly keeping watch over your souls. That's why a pastor has a right to come up and say, Folk, Listen, buddy, there's something wrong in your spirit. I may not know it right now, but I can feel there's something wrong in you. You need to go home and pray and whatever it is, get it sorted out in you. We watch over your souls. We can tell them something's not right. At least a real pastor can. For they watch over your souls. Hallelujah. Keeping watch over your souls, guarding your spiritual welfare. I can tell you right now, there's people, even in my church, Pastor Terry says, well, you got a mature church, and compared to others, I do. But there's people in New Day Christian Center, if it wasn't for the prayers of staff members, they would have been destroyed already. Yeah. They're not ate up because their pastors are intercessors. Well, you go tell them they're messed up? No. I pray for them. I watch over their soul. I protect them and pray for grace to open their eyes until it becomes open, blatant rebellion. And we've dealt with that New Day Christian Center. We've had somebody come in and rebel, and I dealt with it so it wouldn't pollute the others. That's the only time when it comes out in the open. 
But there's things going on in the spirit realm not right that I gotta pray demons off of you, or you're just opening the doors wide open by the things you think I don't see. Hallelujah. Watch. Keeping watch over your souls, guarding your spiritual welfare. Who's doing that? Your spiritual leaders. If they're spiritual leaders, if they're if they're players and pimps of LA type preachers and all this stuff that just for the money I'll prophesy over you, forget it. <laughs> You're all wide open for the devil. But real men and women of God that don't do it for the money, that do it because they love people's lives, that do it because they want to see them grow in Jesus Christ and be real servants of God, that go home and pray and weep in tears in, in, in wee hours of the morning and you never know about it, keeping you alive off demons you're inviting wide open. Hallelujah. And you know it's true. You know it's true. Well, I don't know why this is happening, Pastor. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. If you're sleeping around, there's all kinds of big demons being involved. How come you're not dead? You got a pastor praise for you. You're drinking and running around? You got a pastor praise for you. It's not because of th this greasy grace. It's because some intercessor somewhere is pleading the blood of Jesus, binding demons that you're throwing your life wide open to. And then you come and say, well, I confess the word. How come it's not working? Well, it won't work in a lifestyle inviting hell. And the reason you're not dying so far is because you got preachers that are praying death off of you. Told you it was going to get sober. Are you ready? Can you handle more? It gets worse. <laughs> Buy yourself a classic amplified. Wow. Not these new ones on the market. They, they're, they're, they're not as good. Get a, cl a classic amplified. Watch this. Keeping watch over your souls, guarding your spiritual wel welfare as men who will have to re render an account of their trust. Doing, do your part to let them do this with gladness. And not with sign. Here we go again. The second you make your pastors do that, you're losing all spiritual benefit in your life. Make sure you do their part that they can uh, do this, do their part, let them do this with gladness and not with sighing and groaning. For that would not be profitable to you either. You start losing the benefits when your lifestyle and your conduct makes the past go, oh God, Jesus, help me. Now, if that's not good enough, listen to this in the Living Bible. Hallelujah. Now you get to see Pastor. Well, Pastor really is 67 years old. Well, that's, I don't care how old you are, that's tiny print. Amen. Listen to it in the, in the Living Bible. Are you ready? Obey your spiritual leaders and be willing to do what they say. For their work is to watch over your souls. And God will judge them. Here you go. Don't let people be, many people be out there trying to be teachers because we will stand a double judgment before God. So when I preach and teach, it's with holy fear because I know I'll answer to God. I have to give account to God for how I pastor you and how I preach and teach his word. And I take it with fearful seriousness. Much more serious than people attend church. Are you ready? And be willing to do whatever they say for their, for their work is to watch over your souls and God will judge them on how well they do this. Any preacher that just shows up and preaches and doesn't get involved and really and really develop you in the Lord, they're just performers. They're just professional preachers. And you've been around me. You know I'm after growth. I'm after serious maturity. I'm after change. I'm here for you to grow, not to perform. 
I got to answer to God. You said 20 years of my church and never changed. I have not done my job. Hallelujah. I don't care how good you feel coming to my church for 20 years. If you come to church for 20 years and you haven't grown to where you can witness, you can preach the gospel out on the streets, you can tithe, you can, you can get involved in the affairs of kingdom, you can become an intercessor, you're a prayer warrior. If you haven't grown beyond sitting, soaking, and enjoying yourself, I have failed and I'll answer to God for it. Hallelujah. For their work is to watch over your souls and, and God will judge them on how well they do it. Give them reason to report joyfully about you to the Lord. Give them reason to report joyfully about you to the Lord. God, this, they're growing so fast. Your grace is so evident in their lives. They're such a blessing to me. That's how you live. <laughs> How many of you are, are, are moving and growing and, 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 and being who you're supposed to be in church to where every time I talk to you, to God about you, it's with joy? Or is it about issues? Oh, Lord Jesus. Give them reason to report, report joyfully about you to the Lord and not with sorrow. Watch. For there, then you will suffer for it. Not with sorrow, for then you will suffer for it. Now, folks, that's, just, that's in the Holy Bible. That's in the uncompromised word. Here you go. Why is this happening to me? Part of why bad things are happening to you is because you have an unsubmitted, unteachable spirit. And you suffer for it because you won't listen. You won't follow godly advice. You won't do anything the preacher says. You know, you, well, that's TC's opinion. But I, this is how I, I'll tell you what I, just forget it. And you suffer for that. And I would a answer to God if I don't tell you the truth about it. This is all wrapped up in how does the word work in my life. I can be the best preacher about the word, but if you won't listen to me, if you won't work with me, if you won't flow with me, seed's gone. You suffer for it. Now you match that up with all the other preachers that tell you, well, we're going to preach revelation, you're going to change, and could care less how you live away from the building. No, no. We have to stay submitted. And listen, write this down. I cannot allow a spirit of rebellion in any degree in my life. And what's the most prominent spirit with Jezebel? Rebellion. What's the spirit of this age? Rebellion. What's the spirit of this generation? Don't you tell me how to have sex. I'll sleep with another man if I want. I'll sleep with another woman if I want. I'll go to church when I want. I'll go to whatever church I want. I'll find a gay church. I'll find a drinking church. I'll find a party in church. Don't you tell me. Rebellion. Number one, choose whose side you're going to be on. Number two, life-dependent commitment. Number three, never allow yourself the excuse to get tired and quit. Number four, how is your attitude? Do you stay in joy? Do you stay in faith? Do you stay in peace? Number five, how are you submitted? And is rebellion allowed never allow a rebellious spirit toward the word toward god or toward god's servants amen did you learn something today give the lord a great big hand clap now listen if you're out there and you're not born again i want to give you the chance to come to this loving saving delivering jesus for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him hanging their faith and depending on their eternal salvation in him shall not die and perish without God, but shall have everlasting life. Say this prayer with me. Repent in your heart. Say, Dear Father God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I recognize my sin. I acknowledge my sin. And I stand before you now and I repent 
of that acknowledged sin. Forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. I cry out to you as to become my Savior. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save me. Wash me clean. Make a new creature out of me. Be my God, my Savior, my King. And from this day forward, I will serve you all the days of my life. Now receive the wonder of the Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the teacher, the guide, the counselor, the comforter, the power, the resurrection power of God. Receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And to you that are sick and afflicted in your body, stretch your hands out here with me. Agree in faith. Touch my hand by faith. Just reach out right where you're at. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind these demons of affliction and infirmity. Loose the people in Jesus' name. Loose the people in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Stretch your hand out to the twisted bent bodies. Be straight in Jesus' name to the afflicted mind, spirits of depression, suicide. I bind you, you lying devils of hell. Come out of the people now. Come out in Jesus' name. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. You're saved, you're delivered, you're healed now in the name of Jesus Christ. Now give Him praise for it. Hallelujah. God bless you.